Okay, it's uh, a pleasure to introduce the first uh, uh, lecturer, who is uh, Professor Barbara Raiden, and uh, she's going to talk about introduction to cosmology. Thank you. It's an honor to be the first lecturer of the entire school, but before I begin, I have one very important question. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, I hear nods and waves. The other important question is, can you see my slides? For this talk, I'm going to be using PowerPoint. I'll reserve the blackboard you know, in case I need it for any questions that you have. I try to use large font in my PowerPoint, primarily to avoid the temptation to shove too much in. Because, of course, this is a lecture that's going to have to cover a great deal of ground. It's customary at this point for the speaker to you know, thank the organizers for inviting them to give lectures. But I realize that the organizers have asked me to do an impossible task. I'm supposed to give you an introduction to cosmology. However, I'm sure that all of you have been introduced to cosmology at some level. Some of you are very well acquainted with cosmology. And some of you, I'm sure, have you know, long-term, very close friendships with cosmology. However, I want to make sure that so for the rest of the two weeks that the school lasts, that we all have the same common background knowledge about cosmology. So I'm sure that all of you have heard some of what I'm going to be talking about today. And I would bet that some of you have heard all that I'm going to be talking about today. However, you know, it's necessary that we go through this material. And to keep things interesting, I'll try to you know, throw in little historical tidbits now and then. I'm assuming I was asked to give a course or a series of lectures on Introduction to Cosmology because I've written a textbook entitled Introduction to Cosmology. They probably Googled Introduction to Cosmology and <laughs> found the cover of the textbook. Anyway, this invitation was very well timed since I am in the process of producing a second edition of my textbook. So my head is you know, jammed full of various cosmological bits. Um, Second edition, published December of this year, Cambridge University Press makes excellent presents for all of your friends. <laughs> OK, after that commercial announcement, there's the public service announcement. What I'm going to be talking about for the course of the four lectures. Today, I'll be talking about what we might call the standard model of cosmology. So, I put standard model in quotation marks because there's not a standard model of cosmology the way there's a standard model of particle physics. However, in recent decades, cosmologists have converged upon a common or standard model of how the universe evolves, how it behaves. And I would argue this is a standard model that consists of two parts. The first larger part I'll be talking about this morning, the hot Big Bang model, which stated simply says the universe began a finite time ago in an extremely dense, extremely hot state, and has been expanding continuously since then. However, over the past couple of decades, astronomers have developed a specialized subset of hot Big Bang models. And now the standard way in which we describe the universe is the lambda CDM model. Lambda stands for the cosmological constants, a form of dark energy. CDM is cold, dark matter. So the universe began expanding. And today, we look around the universe. And the evidence that I'll be going into this afternoon indicates that most of the energy density of the universe is in the form of dark energy possibly a cosmological constant. And the remainder of the universe consists of matter that is dark, doesn't absorb, emit, or scatter photons, and is cold. It's been non-relativistic since very early in the history of the universe. In a hot Big Bang model that's continuously expanding, the mean particle energy decreases with time. And Tuesday, tomorrow, I'll be talking about those moments in the universe that are special because the energy drops to an interesting level. So when the energy drops sufficiently low below 13.6 electron volts, the ionization energy of hydrogen, you have recombination. 
and by looking at the cosmic microwave background. We learn a lot about that special epoch. Going back further in time, when the energy dropped sufficiently low between, sufficiently low <laughs> below 2.2 MeV, the dissociation energy of deuterium, then you had an era of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And the primordial abundances of light elements like deuterium and lithium tell us what the universe was like back then. And then finally, just a few words about inflation. There's an entire series of lectures on inflation, but I'll just give you the background of what inflation is and why people thought it was a really good idea. And finally, Wednesday, at last, I'll be abandoning the fiction of cosmologists that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, and I'll be talking about the formation of structure, the formation of superclusters, voids, galaxies, and little teeny tiny things like stars. Warning, I am an astronomer. All right, don't panic and bolt for the exits. You just need to know that astronomers are like everyone else, only they use a very strange language. So in my talks, I'll be taking the point of view of an astronomer, not a theoretical particle physicist. And also, I'll be using some of the units commonly used by astronomers. So in cosmology, sometimes we have to talk about very large length scales and very long time scales and very large masses. So the basic time unit I'll be using is the giga year, 10 to the 9 years, about 3 times 10 to the 16 seconds. Or to use fundamental units of time, it's about 10 to the 60 times the Planck time. So in Planck units, we'll be talking about very long time scales indeed. The giga year is useful to astronomers because many astronomical objects are giga years old, for instance, the sun, about 4.57 giga years. And the age of the universe, that is the time that's elapsed since the beginning of the expansion in the Big Bang, about 13.7 giga years. The unit of distance frequently used in cosmology is the megaparsecs, um, 10 to the 6 parsecs about 3 times 10 to the 6 light years, or 3 times 10 to the 22 meters. And again, in Planck units, oh, it's pretty big, about 10 to the 57 times the Planck distance. Examples of the megaparsec in action, from here to the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy neighbor, the nearest neighboring galaxy comparable in size to our own, about three quarters of a megaparsec. The distance from here to the coma cluster of galaxies, about 100 megaparsecs. So fix in your mind, a megaparsec is a useful distance for measuring the distance between galaxies. 100 megaparsecs, that's about the scale of distances between rich clusters, like the coma cluster. The standard unit of mass is the solar mass. The circle with the dot in the center, that's the astronomer's symbol for the sun, it's of great antiquity, historically speaking. It's the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for the sun god Ra. So astronomy goes back really, really far into human history. And a lot of the terminology used by astronomers is kind of archaic. The mass of the sun, about 2 times 10 to the 33 kilograms. Notice that in Planck units, it's not as humongously big. The sun's mass is about 10 to the 38 times the Planck mass. And so when we're talking about reasonably big objects, like galaxies and clusters of galaxies, the mass of the Milky Way galaxy, about 10 to the 12 solar masses. The mass of the coma cluster of galaxies contains many thousands of galaxies and it has a mass of about 10 to the 15 solar masses. So these are some of the time scales, length scales, and mass scales you should have in the back of your head when I go off into my astronomical tangents. It's commonly stated that the hot Big Bang model 
has a foundation made up of three observations, Ulmer's paradox, Hubble's law, and the cosmic microwave background. So I'm going to go through all three of those in turn very briefly. Ulmer's paradox is simply the statement that the night sky is dark. It's named after Friedrich Ulbers, who wrote quite a long paper about the darkness of the night sky in the year 1823. However, Ulbers was neither the first person to worry about the darkness of the night sky nor the last person. He wasn't even the first person to give a correct explanation for the darkness of the night sky. But, you know, science is like that. Names sometimes get arbitrarily attached. Now, when I say the night sky is dark, I can quantify that. Go above the Earth's atmosphere, pick out a seemingly black patch of sky where there are no bright stars, and the flux of light that you receive from that patch comes to about 5 times 10 to the minus 17 watts per square meter of your telescope per square arc second of the sky. Compare that to the brightness of the sun. The surface brightness of the sun is about 5 times 10 to the minus 3 watts per square meter per square arc second of the sun's disk. So saying that the night sky is dark is saying, oh, it's about 14 orders of magnitude lower than the surface brightness of the sun. For most of human history, people did not think that the darkness of the sky was paradoxical at all. In the geocentric model of the ancient Greeks, illustrated here on the left in a 16th century engraving, the night sky was dark because, well, there's this celestial sphere, a thin spherical shell centered on the Earth, and that celestial sphere is dark, aside from some thousands of little bright points of light attached to it, the lights that we call stars. So, no paradox there. We only see a few thousand stars in the night sky, the ancient Greeks said, because there are only a few thousand stars out there, and they're all stuck down or somehow embedded within the, the celestial sphere. Things changed, however, in the heliocentric model of Copernicus. One of the followers of Copernicus, an English astronomer called Thomas Diggs, realized that, oh, wait, we don't need a celestial sphere anymore. When you look up at stars at night and they go in circles around the celestial poles, that's not the rotation of a celestial sphere. That's the reflection of the rotation of the Earth. And therefore, Diggs said, the stars can all be at different distances. The brighter stars are the ones closest to us. The dimmer stars are the ones further away. And Diggs concluded, we can have an infinite universe containing an infinite number of stars. And he wrote it down in this wonderful Elizabethan language. Let me read it to you. This orb of stars fixed infinitely up extendeth itself in altitude spherically, and therefore, immovable the palace of felicity, garnished with perfect shining, whoa, I can't even read it, glorious lights innumerable. So the stars are glorious lights, lights, but the important part, they are innumerable. Diggs means this literally. You cannot number them because they are infinite in number. And when you have an infinite universe filled with an infinite number of stars, that's where the paradox comes in. So let's do a little calculation, just a simple one to get us warmed up on Monday morning. If you are in an infinite universe filled with an infinite number of stars, how far can you see on average before your line of sight intersects a star? Okay. First bit of in astronomical, astronomical information. Sorry, I'm slightly jet lagged this morning. A star is an opaque sphere that glows in the dark. Okay, got that? Now, my astronomical colleagues who study stars will point out, of course, stars come in all sizes, from little dwarf stars to enormous supergiant stars. But let's take the sun as a typical middle-sized star. The sun's radius 
700,000 kilometers in my favorite units of length, the megaparsec, that comes to 2 times 10 to the minus 14 megaparsecs. The number of stars per cubic megaparsec, we don't know exactly, not the sort of thing you can do counting stars one by one, but if you take a big cube of space, a few hundred megaparsecs on a side, count up the galaxies, estimate the number of stars per galaxy, it comes to an average of about a billion stars per cubic megaparsec today. So there you are, you're looking outward along a line of sight, and of course, if you draw a cylinder whose radius is equal to the sun's radius around that line of sight, if there exists a star whose center is inside that cylinder, then it's going to block your view of more distant stars. So, of course, it's just the question, how big does this cylinder have to be? What does its volume have to be in order for it to contain a star on average? Well, it's just a mean free path problem. The distance lambda that you can see typically before your line of sight is stopped by this opaque star, one over the number density of stars times the cross section of a star. So 10 to the 9 per cubic megaparsec times 10 to the minus 27 square megaparsecs. So it's a cross sectional area of a star. And it comes out to 10 to the 18 megaparsecs. 10 to the 18 megaparsecs. Even to an astronomer, that's a very long distance. However, it is a finite distance. And so Olbers and other people who studied this problem after Thomas Diggs realized that in an infinite universe, or you know, one that extends at least 10 to the 18 megaparsecs in all directions, the sky is going to be paved with stars. Every direction you look, you're going to see a star. And of course, since Euclidean geometry tells us the flux we receive from a star falls off as 1 over the square of distance, and since the angular area subtended by a star falls off as 1 over the square of distance, then the surface brightness of a star in watts per square meter per square arc second should be independent of distance. So the sky, by this analysis, should have a surface brightness as great as that of the sun everywhere. Let's imagine paving the entire sky with suns. Uh, obviously, the sky brightness in our own universe is smaller than this value by 14 orders of magnitude. I frequently make calculations and get the wrong answer, but being off by 14 orders of magnitude, uh, yeah, that's really bad. And so the calculation is correct. So it's a question of garbage in, garbage out. One of my assumptions that went into that calculation has to be wrong. So which of the assumptions that I made was incorrect? And of course, we could sit around and brainstorm, wondering what the actual resolution of Olber's paradox could be. I've just put up four of the most obvious resolutions of the paradox. Answer number one, that was the one given by Olbers himself in the 1820s. He said, well, if there were some sort of opaque screen between us and the more distant stars, that would hide distant stars from our view. And therefore, that could be a resolution of Olbers' paradox. Unfortunately, this is a resolution that doesn't work in the long run. If you put an opaque screen between us and distant stars, the reason the screen is opaque is because it absorbs light. And the light heats up the screen until in its equilibrium state, it has a surface temperature equal to that of the surface of a star. And it's two glows at 5 times 10 to the minus 3 watts per square meter per square arc second. So, well, if you try to screen off distant stars, the screen itself heats up until it becomes as bright as a star. However, you can resolve it using method number two. You can just say, OK, so the universe isn't infinite. If 
the universe comes to a halt at some distance much smaller than 10 to the minus 18 megaparsecs, then the night sky will be dark. Notice this resolution also works if the universe is infinitely large, but for some reason, stars only occupy a small finite volume. A third possible resolution, slightly more subtle than the previous one, is that oh, perhaps the universe is of finite age. Since light travels at a finite speed, if the age of the universe is some time t, then if c times t is much smaller than 10 to the 18 megaparsecs, then stars beyond this distance won't have had time to send light to us. This resolution also works if the universe is infinitely old, but you know, for some reason, stars only have existed for a finite length of time. Fourth possible resolution, well, you know, maybe distant stars just have lower surface brightness. Maybe we're looking out there, we're seeing the surface of stars, but you no, know, they're really, really dark for some reason. Well, in fact, the reason why distant stars have a lower surface brightness is just, um, well, first of all, you can have non-Euclidean geometry. Also, hmm, you could have an expanding universe, and the light from distant stars is redshifted to lower photon energy. Well, in our particular universe, well described by a hot Big Bang, the resolution is mostly number three. It's mostly due to the fact that the universe is of finite age, so stars have existed for less than 14 billion years. And it's a little bit of four. More distant stars have a lower surface brightness because of Tolman fading, uh, an effect you see in an expanding universe. But primarily, it's just the fact that we live in a universe of finite age, unlike the eternal universe that was assumed by Olbers in computing, oh yeah, you know, the sky should be bright at night. So Olbers' paradox is, is putting limits on our universe. It can't be infinitely large and infinitely old and obey Euclidean geometry all at the same time. Something's got to give. Well, the thing that gave became apparent in the 1920s with the discovery of Hubble's law. The fact that distant galaxies have redshifts in their spectrum, and that redshift is proportional to our distance from us. I told you all you need to know about stars is that they are opaque spheres that glow in the dark. You also need to know that they have absorption lines in their spectra from the hydrogen and other elements in their atmospheres. So galaxies contain stars, galaxies have absorption lines in their spectra. If they're active galactic nuclei, then they also have emission lines from the hot gas that the central black hole is gobbling. So it is, in most cases, relatively easy to measure the wavelength of the absorption and emission lines from galaxies. So suppose an emission line or absorption line has a rest wavelength lambda sub e. For instance, Lyman alpha has a rest wavelength of, um, gosh, now I've forgotten. I am jet lagged. Lambda sub e. And you measure that same absorption or emission line in the spectrum of a distant galaxy, and it's some value lambda sub zero, which in general is not equal to lambda sub e. And the redshift is just wavelength that you observe minus the wavelength in the rest frame of the, lights, of the light source emitting the light, normalized by dividing by lambda sub e. Now, technically, this number z is only a redshift if z is greater than zero. That means you're shifted towards longer wavelength. So for lines in the visible range of the spectrum, the longest wavelength of visible light is red. If z is less than zero, you're shifted to shorter wavelengths, which logically should be called a violet shift, but astronomers inevitably call it a blue shift, probably because it's easier to say. 
The first person to measure the redshift of a galaxy was Vesto Slifer. And this is his spectrum of the Andromeda galaxy. He was doing something really difficult with the technology of the time. That's smudge running horizontally. That's the spectrum of the galaxy. This is a photographic plate. So you know, that's pale vertical line. That's an absorption line there. The more easily seen spectra above and below, those are emission line spectra used to calibrate the actual spectrum of the galaxy. So Vesto Slifer was doing something really difficult. And he was interested in taking the spectrum of galaxies from 1912 onward, in part because people weren't sure exactly what they were. The Andromeda Galaxy wasn't called the Andromeda Galaxy. It was called the Andromeda Nebula. There were other spiral nebulae like the Andromeda Galaxy out there. And by 1923, Arthur Eddington, in his influential textbook, The Mathematical Theory of Relativity, was able to make up a list of 41 spiral nebulae, galaxies. And here's their catalog number, their right ascension and declination, where they are in the sky. And here's their redshift or blue shift, expressed as the equivalent radial velocity. Notice most of these numbers in the right-hand column are positive numbers. Of the 41 galaxies whose spectra had been measured, mostly by Vesto Slifer, 36 redshifts, 35 blue shifts. An interesting problem in combinatorics. If you toss a fair coin 41 times, how likely are you to get 36 or more heads? That's something like a chance of one in a million. So if this were just a random selection from galaxies, some with red shifts and some with blue shifts, you would not expect to see what Eddington called the great preponderance of positive receding velocities. It's very striking, he said. Not merely that red shifts were so very common compared to blue shifts, but also if you take the average radial velocity of these 41 galaxies, over 500 kilometers per second. By contrast, if you look at stars in the solar neighborhood, they're typically moving around 30 or 40 kilometers per second relative to the sun. So the velocities you deduce, radial velocity equals c times z for these galaxies, one, mostly positive, two, very high in velocity compared to motion of stars within a galaxy like the Milky Way. Now, in 1923, the distances to galaxies wasn't well known. It wasn't known whether they were large distant objects comparable in size to our Milky Way galaxy, or if there were small satellite galaxies around the Milky Way galaxy. But Edwin Hubble decided, oh, I'm going to determine the distance to galaxies using a Cepheid variable star as a standard candle. A standard candle, more about them later. They're just objects whose luminosity you know. And Edwin Hubble was looking at the Andromeda galaxy. Again, this is a photographic negative. So the black blob in the middle, that's the bright central bulge of the galaxy. On this photographic plate, taken on the 6th of October, 1923, he marked a couple of novae, N for nova. These are new stars that weren't there before. Notice up at the top, however, first he wrote down N. He thought it was a nova. But then he wrote down V-A-R, exclamation point. Really excited. This is a variable star. It's not a one-shot nova, becomes bright, and then disappears. But it's a variable Cepheid star. And by comparing its flux to the flux of similar Cepheids within our own galaxy, he was able to make an estimate of the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. His conclusion was the corresponding distance, that is the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, about 0.285 megaparsecs. Now, 
wasn't quite right. The best estimate today is about three times, but at least he was within an order of magnitude. So Hubble now has a tool. He has a standard candle he can use to estimate the distance to galaxies. And of course, you're an astronomer, you have a tool, you start using it. And by the year 1929, Hubble published a famous paper in which he had not merely the measured red shifts, and in a few cases, blue shifts of nearby galaxies, but he also had distance estimates. And off on the left, you see the plot from his 1929 paper. The axis labels aren't very legible. Uh, horizontal, that's distance, 0, 1, and 2 megaparsecs. Vertical axis, that's the radial velocity, c times z, 0, 500, 1,000 kilometers per second. And the two diagonal lines, that's his best fit to the data using different weighting schemes for the individual galaxies. So he says, not only is there an excess of red shifts over blue shifts, however, also, the blue-shifted galaxies are relatively close to us. And as you go further away, you find that the red shifts are larger and larger and larger. There's a lot of scatter in this plot due to the peculiar velocities of galaxies. They're being tugged to and fro by their neighbors. The reason why the Andromeda galaxy actually has a blue shift rather than a red shift is that our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are falling towards each other. So random gravitational tugs of this kind means there's inevitably going to be scatter in this plot. However, you know, flash forward to the 21st century using better distance estimators. Hubble was chronically underestimating distances and using measured redshifts you still see a similar linear relationship between velocity, c times z, and distance. Hubble's law is important in a hot Big Bang model because if you write down the relation, the estimated radial velocity, c times redshift, linearly proportional to distance, the proportionality constant, h sub zero, sometimes called h naught, called the Hubble constant, a tribute to Edwin Hubble. And I'm just going to say 68 plus or minus 2 kilometers per second per megaparsec of distance. You can get into some interesting debates about so, the actual value of h naught, but most values come to about 68, so I'll assume that value. If you take the inverse of this, well, kilometers and megaparsecs both have dimensionality of distance, so 1 over h is just going to be a time scale, which turns out to be about 14.4 giga years. It's an interesting time scale because, well, if a galaxy is moving away from you with a velocity that's proportional to its distance, you work out if its speed has been constant, how long has it taken to reach that distance from you? And you find out, oh, it's a time that is equal to 1 over h naught, and it's independent of the current distance between two galaxies. So if you think of running the film of the universe backwards at a time about equal to the Hubble time ago, all of the galaxies were crammed together into a small volume. This is an estimate, of course, that assumes the relative velocity is constant which it isn't actually, but it turns out to be a pretty good approximation for our universe. If you have a time span built into your expanding universe, you also have a distance built into your expanding universe, c times the Hubble time, 4,400 megaparsecs. So, Edwin Hubble, he's an astronomer, he observes redshift proportional to distance. What does this imply for our universe? Well, Hummel's law is the result of a uniform expansion, one that's homogeneous and isotropic. So 
If, for instance, you take three points in space, one, two, three, connect them by geodesics to make a triangle, uniform expansion tells you that the shape of the triangle remains constant as it expands. The fact that it's pure expansion with no rotation means the orientation of the triangle remains constant as it expands. And so this kind of uniform homogeneous isotropic expansion tells you that the distance between any pair of galaxies increases as a scalar function A of t, called by cosmologists the scale factor. It's the same for every pair, and it's a function only of time and not of position. So every triangle everywhere in the galaxy undergoes homogeneous expansion. It's isotropic means that A is a scalar. It's not a tensor. It doesn't imply expansion rates different in different directions. And again, there's no shear, no rotation, just pure expansion. So if every distance is proportional to this scale factor A of t, we can normalize it. In my talks, I'm going to be using one of the possible standard normalizations that the scale factor is equal to 1 at a reference time t sub 0, which equals now. So you have homogeneous isotropic expansion. It is described by this simple scalar function of time. What's the relative velocity of any two points? Well, you take the time derivative, and you find, oh, the velocity of galaxy 1 relative to galaxy 2 is proportional to the distance between those two galaxies. And the proportionality constants, let's call it h for Hubble, is just the time derivative of the scale factor divided by the scale factor itself. So, a little bit more cosmological jargon. This function defined as a dot over a is called the Hubble parameter. Generally, it will vary with time in an expanding universe. And the value of the Hubble parameter is measured right now by Edwin Hubble, or more accurately by Wendy Friedman and her collaborators. This is called the Hubble constant. So the Hubble constant is the value of a time varying parameter as measured at a particular time. Now, when Hubble published Hubble's law, it did not immediately result in people saying, oh, hot Big Bang Theory. Because although Hubble's law is consistent with the Big Bang model for the universe, it doesn't demand it. If the universe is expanding today, that does not necessarily imply that it began a finite time ago in an extremely dense state. And in fact, in the mid-20th century, there are two competing models for the universe. People who supported the hot Big Bang model embraced what's called the cosmological principle. Notice it's called the cosmological principle. It's one that's very important to modern cosmology. And the cosmological principle is just the assumption that once you get to sufficiently large scales, about 100 megaparsecs or so, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. However, in a hot Big Bang model, Things can change with time. In fact, they do change with time. The universe started out a lot hotter and denser than it is now. However, the competing theory, the steady state theory, as proposed by Bondi and Gold and by Fred Hoyle in 1948, went a step further. It embraced not merely the cosmological principle, but the perfect cosmological principle. It said not only is the universe homogeneous and isotropic in space, but it's also unchanging in time. So that global properties of the universe, you know, like the Hubble constants and the average density and the temperature of the universe, these are all constant as a function of time.
which is an interesting principle. Could be philosophically attractive, but is it consistent with observations? Over the next two weeks, we're going to learn a lot of wonderful theory, some of it a little bit speculative. But in the end, you know, if your theory contradicts observations, nobody's going to be particularly interested. However, in 1948, the steady state theory wasn't entirely cr crazy. If you assume the perfect cosmological principle, you have to assume the Hubble constant is constant with time, really. In that case, the relative velocity of any two points goes as h naught times r, where h naught is constant. Oh. Time derivative of something is a constant times something. That's exponential growth, which is interesting. Also, the steady state model assumed that the average density of the universe is constant with time. And that implies, since volume increases exponentially, that you have to be creating matter. As a volume of the universe expands, massive particles pop out of nowhere in order to keep the density constant. So notice that exponential growth, r, the distance between two galaxies, approaches zero only asymptotically as you go to t equals minus infinity. So there is no instance when the universe began expanding. And if you plug in the observed Hubble constant and the observed mass density of our universe, it means you have to take, you have to create about six times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms per cubic meter per giga year. A sufficiently low rate that you can't just sit around and stare at a cubic meter of space in the hopes of seeing, I don't know, a hydrogen atom pop out of nowhere. So you couldn't observationally verify the steady state model in that way, just by looking for the creation of matter. So in 1963, the famous cosmologist Malcolm Longair was just a small graduate student starting out. And his thesis advisor told him, there are only two and a half facts in cosmology. So only a little more than half a century ago, cosmology had only two and a half facts. So cosmology schools back in 1963 would have been really, really short. The two and a half facts that were known then is, you know, number one, the sky is dark at night, Olber's paradox. Number two, galaxies have a redshift proportional to their distance, Hubble's law. And the additional half of facts, known in 1963, was that the contents of the universe have probably changed as the universe grows older. So the perfect cosmological principle that things don't change was probably false. This was only a half a fact in 1963, because at that time, radio surveys of active galactic nuclei and quasars were only just beginning to get uh, sensitive enough to measure high redshift galaxies. In 1963, the record holder for the highest redshift galaxy known was that little fellow right there, the radio galaxy 3C295, with a redshift of a little less than a half. So that's a light travel time of you know, less than seven giga years. And so people were beginning to realize, you know, there were a lot more radio galaxies and quasars in the past than there are now, but the statistics were not yet very firm. And so this half a fact, you know, things have changed in the universe with time, wasn't elevated to a full-fledged fact until the discovery of the cosmic microwave background by Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson in the year 1965. So, First of all, they discovered that the cosmic microwave background was isotropic. And in order to detect microwaves, well, you need to get above the Earth's damp atmosphere. Water molecules are very good at absorbing most wavelengths of microwaves. <laughs> but the uh, COBE satellites measured 
the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background over a wide range of frequencies and found that it was extremely well fitted by a black body spectrum. That is, the distribution of photon energies had a Planck distribution, or equivalently, it had a Bose-Einstein distribution for massless bosons. So here I've expressed it as the number density of photons as a function of frequency. And you know, this is just a gorgeous, beautiful black body curve. And the temperature is 2.7255 plus or minus 0 0.0006 Kelvin. Very well measured temperature. So, oh. black body microwaves. Why does this tell us that the universe has evolved with time? Well, black body spectra are produced by opaque objects in which the photons and the absorbers and scatterers come to the same temperature, they come to kinetic equilibrium. And so if you want a black body spectrum, you have to have an opaque source. Stars are opaque objects that glow in the dark. They're pretty good black bodies, although they're chopped up by absorption lines. And the cosmic microwave background is a beautiful black body, which means that the early universe was opaque. Now, the universe at most wavelengths is highly transparent. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see galaxies at a redshift of a half. So why was the early universe opaque? It's because the baryonic matter in the universe, in the early universe, it was hot and dense, so the baryonic stuff was ionized. Oh, jargon alert, baryonic matter is matter that's made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So you're made up of baryonic matter. Only the protons and neutrons, of course, are baryons. The electrons are leptons. However, since a baryon, a proton, or neutron is over 1,800 times the mass of the electron, cosmologists refer to it as baryonic matter for its most massive component. However, the electrons cannot be forgotten because they're the ones that interact most readily with photons. Free electrons can scatter photons of any frequency with a Thomson cross-section. And so in the early universe, it was ionized, it was dense, you had a high density of free electrons. And so go far back enough in time, the rate at which photons scattered from free electrons was greater than the expansion rate of the universe, as expressed by the Hubble parameter. Now, equivalently, that means the mean free path of the photons before scattering was very short compared to the Hubble distance back then. So saying the early universe was opaque is a statement about the relative distance of the mean free path and the Hubble distance. So things have changed. Back then, the universe was opaque. Now it's mostly transparent. This, of course, is a severe violation of the perfect cosmological principle. And it was the discovery of the cosmic microwave background in the mid-1960s that really made the hot Big Bang model the preferred model for cosmology. The steady state model in which everything changes as, <laughs> excuse me, in which the average density is constant as a function of time because hydrogen atoms pop out of nowhere. It was no longer favored after the mid-1960s. Cosmic microwave background, a very rich source of information worthy of, oh, I don't know, a series of four lectures, say. I'll just you know, run through the basics. If you look at the entire sky at microwave wavelengths, as the WMAP satellite and the Planck satellite have done, you can make a map of the sky. This is a map of the sky in galactic coordinates. So the Milky Way runs horizontally. The center of our galaxy in the constellation Sagittarius is at the center. The blobby pink line going from side to side, that's foreground emission from gas within our own Milky Way galaxy. It's mostly synchrotron emission, which has a spectrum very different from a black body, so it's 
relatively easy to subtract the foreground emission. In the background, you see, oh, it's white on one half of the sky and black on the other half. This grayscale map is a map of temperature, although the average temperature of the cosmic microwave background is 2.7255 Kelvin. On half of the sky, it's about 3.5 millikelvin, hotter than average. The other half, it's about 3.5 millikelvin, cooler than average. So you have a dipole anisotropy in the cosmic microwave background. One hemisphere of the sky is about one part per thousand hotter than average, and the other hemisphere is a part per thousand cooler than average. Well, this dipole is interesting. It's telling us something interesting about the universe, but it's telling us something interesting about the local universe. The CMB dipole anisotropy is due mainly, or perhaps almost entirely, due to the Doppler shift from our motion through space. The W map and Planck satellites are at the L2 Lagrangian points on the far side of the Earth from the sun. And so W map was, still is for that matter, going around the sun about once per year. It requires a velocity of about 30 kilometers per second. The sun is going around the center of our galaxy about 220, maybe 240 kilometers per second. And the reason why the Andromeda galaxy is blue shifted relative to us is that our galaxy and Andromeda are falling towards each other. And so our galaxy's motion relative to the center of mass of the Andromeda Milky Way system, about 80 kilometers per second. So subtract all of these well-known motions in vector space, and you find out that the local group of galaxies, the little cluster of galaxies containing the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, is moving in the direction of the constellation Hydra with a speed of about two thousandths of the speed of the lights, about 630 kilometers per second. Okay, so why Hydra? What's so great about that constellation? Here's another view of the sky, you know, same map, center of our galaxy at the center again. And the red circle here, that's the CMP dipole. That's the direction in which the local group is moving. All of these other blobs, blotches, these are galaxies whose redshift is known. And you ask, what's around here? Oh, it's the Hydra cluster, a rich cluster of galaxies. The Centaurus cluster, together they're part of the Hydra Centaurus supercluster of galaxies. All of these clusters are labeled by their redshift. Now, Hydra, redshift of 0 0.01, Centaurus, 0 0.02. These are two of the nearest rich clusters of galaxies, so they represent a nearby concentration of mass. So no wonder we're being gravitationally accelerated towards them. So CMB dipole, yeah, very interesting, but it's telling us you know, about those clusters of galaxies over there, not really telling us what the universe was like at the moment it became transparent. However, if you subtract away the dipole anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background, you get this famous map of the sky at microwaves. This is from the Planck satellites, the most recent highest resolution map of the cosmic microwave background. Notice the color scale, red equals higher temperature, which should equal shorter wavelength. So why is it red? I don't know. It's very irritating when they do this scale. But you know, and blue is uh, lower temperature. I know it's because red is psychologically hot and blue is psychologically cold, but it's still deeply irritating. Um, OK, it's blotchy, it's blobby. But notice now uh, the dipole. The scale was plus minus 3.5 millikelvin. Here the scale is plus minus a half a millikelvin. So 
these small angular scale anisotropies are also lower in amplitude than the dipole. So the CMB anisotropy on small scales, once you subtract away the dipole, is telling us what the universe was like when the photons of the cosmic microwave background last scattered from a free electron. And if you look at angular scales between 5 degrees and 180 degrees, so smaller than the dipole, bigger than 5 degrees, you find out that the temperature fluctuations on those angular scales come to about one part in 100,000. I'm ignoring the smaller scale stuff here because, as we'll see later on, on small scales you get interesting baryonic physics interaction with of photons with electrons and through them to the protons. But on these angular scales between 5 and 180 degrees, this is telling you about the density fluctuations and hence the potential fluctuations in the dark matter at the time of last scattering of photons. So the fact that the temperature fluctuations are low in amplitude, about a part in 100,000, is also telling you that these potential, gravitational potential fluctuations were low in amplitude, about one part in 100,000. So back then, the universe was very smooth. The only density perturbations you had were very low in amplitude. Today, the universe is very lumpy. It's got very dense lumps like stars and people. You've got bigger, slightly less dense lumps like galaxies. And you've got structure on all scales, some of it extremely overdense indeed. Your density is about 2 times 10 to the 30 times the average baryon, the baryonic density of the universe. So the story of the universe, then it was hot and dense, now it's cool and lower in density, then it was smooth, now it's lumpy. It's all badly in violation of the perfect cosmological principle. So the cosmic microwave background provides very strong evidence that the universe is in fact evolving with time. It's evolving in the direction of becoming less dense on average. The background temperature is dropping as the photons of the cosmic microwave background cool as the universe expands. And although the average density of matter is dropping as the universe expands, you're getting higher amplitude density fluctuations. So to sum up the observational evidence, Olber's paradox, darkness of the night sky, plus Hubble's law, plus the existence of a cosmic microwave background led to the adoption of um, a standard model, a universe that's very well described by a hot Big Bang model. Started out hot and dense a finite time ago, around 14 giga years. So the cosmological principle, the assumption that things are homogeneous and isotropic, today really only works on large scales, scales of around 100 megaparsecs or more, or about 2% of the Hubble distance or more. In the past, however, you look at the cosmic microwave backgrounds, it gives evidence for a universe that was more nearly homogeneous and isotropic than it is now. So thanks to the cosmological principle, cosmologists use as their starting assumption that, okay, we'll start with a basic model that's homogeneous and isotropic, and then later on we'll add on the bells and whistles, the superclusters and voids and clusters and galaxies and little lumpy cosmologists. The cosmological principle, the assumption that things are homogeneous and isotropic, is so very, very, very useful that in fact it was adopted long before there was any evidence that the universe is actually observably homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. It just makes the mathematics so much easier. 
in the context of general relativity. The expansion of a homogeneous and isotropic universe is described by a Robertson-Walker metric and by the Friedman equation. So very brief run through of the Robertson-Walker metric and the Friedman equation. In the context of general relativity, you want to know what the curvature of a four-dimensional space-time is. This is sort of key to the whole project of general relativity. And you can describe the curvature of space-time with a metric. That's just the mathematical relation that tells you the length of a geodesic between two points, the locally shortest distance between two points. Now, obviously, a simple space is a two-dimensional Euclidean space, like the floor of this room. If I pick one point over here and another point over there, what's the shortest distance between them? Well, you can pull a string in between them, or you can use the laws of Euclid. You have one point xy, the other a little bit further away, x plus dx, y plus dy. And so, ooh, 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 I know the answer to this one. It's just the Pythagorean theorem. Square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. So this is the metric for Euclidean space. And a little reminder, if your GR is rusty, that I'm leaving out the parentheses dx squared is the square of the infinitesimal quantity dx, and not a infinitesimal change in the quantity x squared. But you can change coordinates. You can write down this small distance ds in polar coordinates. Looks different written on the page, but it's a simple coordinate transformation. We can expand into three dimensions. But again, in Euclidean, otherwise known as flat space, the distance between two points is just the three-dimensional extension of the Pythagorean theorem. And again, you can make a coordinate change. It's frequently more useful to use spherical coordinates. So here, theta is your polar angle. Phi is your azimuthal angle. And in space-time, well, in a universe without gravity in the universe of special relativity, the distance between two events in a four-dimensional space-time is just given by the Minkowski metric. ds squared equals minus c squared dt squared plus the spatial component. And here I'm using the convention that the, the spatial, me, spatial term is positive, time is negative. There are people who use the opposite sign convention, but um, it's just essential that the dt squared term is of opposite sign to the spatial terms. And again, can be expressed in spherical coordinates. OK. So all very simple stuff. Euclidean space is uh, mathematically simple, very elegant. But the universe, of course, is not Euclidean. And in general, space-time curvature can be very complicated. Imagine you were doing an animated film and you wanted to show the adventures of a Sharpe dog. That's the kind of dog that has very wrinkly skin. Say, oh my god, to meddle that very wrinkly skin will require a lot of computer time. Then you realize, oh god, the next shot is a close-up. I'm going to have to do every individual hair. Then you realize, oh god, the next shot, the dog's going to be running along. And so you have to do the time dependence of this very complicated curvature on the surface of your Sharpe dog. However, vindication. If the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, there are only three possible curvatures for a three-dimensional space. It can be flat or Euclidean. It can have uniform positive curvature, the three-dimensional equivalence of the surface of a sphere. Or it can have uniform negative curvature, 
the three-dimensional equivalent of this hyperbolic space. And that's it. So you've suddenly made things incredibly simple. Instead of the four-dimensional space-time adventures of a sharp hay dog, you have three possible curvatures for space. So space is homogeneous and isotropic. That's the cosmological principle. But it is allowed to expand in a homogeneous and isotropic manner, or contract. And in that case, the metric of four-dimensional space-time with these restrictions is the Robertson-Walker metric. Important footnote here, also known as the Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric, FRW, or the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric, FLRW. And I'm guessing that every lecturer at the school will have a different choice, but it's all the same metric. So time, space, opposite sign, and you have the square of the scale factor. And notice now you have this curvature function, S sub kappa, which is different for a positively curved space, a flat or Euclidean space, and a negative space. So in general, general relativity gives you a very complicated field equation of a very complicated metric. But with the great power of homogeneity and isotropy, everything you need to know about the curvature of space is boiled down to just a few bits of information. The assumption of homogeneity is extremely powerful. With the assumption of homogeneity and isotropy, everything you need to know about space kind of curvature, well, you need a curvature constant, which can have one of three values, positive, negative, or zero. If kappa is not zero, if you have a curved space, you need to know the radius of curvature at the present day, r sub zero. And you need to know a scale factor as a function of time. And this is just a simple scalar function of time. Starts out at some very small number, is one today. However, as the cartoon character Spider-Man points out, with great power comes great responsibility. And if you want to use the very powerful assumptions underlying the Robertson-Walker metric, you have to first of all know what you mean when you talk about time and space. So here's the Robertson-Walker metric again. This coordinate's t. I've been referring to it as time, as if there were some absolute time in the Newtonian sense that we could all agree on. In the Robertson-Walker metric, the coordinate t is the cosmological proper time, sometimes also known the, as the cosmic time for short, this is time as measured by an observer who sees the universe expanding uniformly, isotropically, around him or her. So you and I, we're not perfect cosmic observers in this sense. We see a dipole in the cosmic microwave background that reflects our motion through space. Remember, that's something at the you know, parts per thousand level. So we're pretty good approximations to a cosmic observer. The radial coordinate r, that's the proper distance from you to a distant galaxy at you know, our reference time t sub zero, the current moment as measured in cosmic time. So it's just the distance from us to the galaxy as measured right now. This is our normalization. The proper distance? Oh, that's just the length of a geodesic from you to the light source as measured right now. So distances that increase as the universe expands, the proper distance from you to a distant galaxy, that increases along with the scale factor. The radius of curvature of the universe, yep, that's a distance that expands along with the scale factor. 
And the wavelength of light moving freely through space, that also expands along with the scale factor. So the cosmic microwave background is shifting to longer peak wavelengths and hence lower temperatures. The coordinates are theta and phi. These are what cosmologists call the co-moving coordinates. Those are coordinates that remain constant as the universe expands. So you're using a coordinate system that expands at the same rate of the universe, very convenient. And the scale factor. How can you tie the scale factor to observable quantities? Well, again, you're looking at a distant light source, a galaxy, say, it was, the light was emitted with a wavelength. Lambda sub e at some time in the past, t sub e. You observe it now with a longer wavelength, lambda sub zero at a time, t sub zero. So what's the redshift that you observe? Oh, okay, you plug it in to the formula for redshift, and you see that the redshift z, this is something you can observe by looking at the spectrum of a galaxy. It's just one over the scale factor at the time the light was emitted, minus one. So when you look at light from a distant galaxy, unfortunately it isn't stamped with the time that the light was emitted. However, it is stamped with something that is equally interesting, the scale factor of the universe at the time the light was emitted. So here's the most distant galaxy known in the year 1963. Its redshift is measured and you say, oh, at the time the light we're now observing was emitted, the scale factor of the universe was 0.68 little over two-thirds of its current value. Here's the current record holder, at least it was the last time I checked Wikipedia, a redshift greater than eight. And so the scale factor at the time the light was emitted was less than one-ninth. So in a monotonically expanding Big Bang model, a larger redshift means you're looking at a galaxy that emitted its light when the scale factor was smaller than it is today, when the cosmic time was earlier than it is today, and you're looking out to larger and larger proper distances. Uh, I just wanted to point out, measuring the redshift of a galaxy when it's bigger than eight, really, really difficult. Of course, if it were easier, you know, people would have done it already. And so, in conclusion, the curvature of space-time related to its energy content by Einstein's field equation, in general very complicated, but once again the power of homogeneity and isotropy flings, comes to the fore. And Alexander Friedman in the 1920s realized that I can take the complexity of Einstein's field equation and using the power of homogeneity and isotropy, reduce it to a very simple equation that links together the scale factor A, the curvature of the universe, remember kappa, tells you whether curvature is positive, negative, or zero, r sub zero, that's the radius of curvature today, and it's all tied into the energy content of the universe. So, um, got a few problems here. Notice also you can express this as an equation linking together the Hubble parameter, the energy density of the universe, and the curvature of the universe today. So, much of cosmology and much of what we'll be focusing our attention on in the next two weeks is how can we measure some of these parameters and use them to determine the others. However, I think now that I've introduced Dr. Friedman, 
along with Drs. Roberts and, and Walker. We have enough to go on for the next lecture after the break about dark matter. So thank you, and please ask me any questions. <laughs>